and uh, I am not going to talk more about it. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce Emmanuel, Emmanuel Ness, Professor Emmanuel Ness. He is a professor in uh, City University in New York and he has written uh, he has uh, written many books and uh, in especially very uh, path breaking work in recent work uh, is Southern Insurgency, The Coming of Global Working Class and also he has, uh, he has written book Guest Workers and Resistance to the U uh, U.S. Corporate Despotism, Southern Insurgency, Immigrants, Union and the U.S. Labor Market. He is also, uh, he is also editor of Zach Poe of Palgrave, Encyclopedia of Imperialism and Anti-Imperialism and editor of famous journal Labor and Society. Uh, now I would like to give this for this address. Yes, I'll stand. Can people hear me without the mic? Thank you very much for the invitation and also the introduction was very important that was presented with respect to the conjuncture today. I share the concern with respect to the capitalist crisis and the rise of fascism as well as the connection between fascism and uh, imperialism. In many respects we are now in a period my view that reflects some of the dynamics of the early 20th century and for that reason I think the point that was made a moment ago is highly impression. Let me just start, first of all, the presentation that I'm supposed to give, which I shall, is imperialist crisis, spontaneous workers' movements, and the question of revolutionary, revolutionary subjectivity. I'd like to first of all give some kind of background in terms of a intellectual history as well as a organizing history that many Americans of my age who grew up in the 70s and 80s and 90s had experienced. And of course, uh, one of the major themes is uh, the end of various isms or the end of various ideological perspectives that had come to an end by, many's, by many people's perspective uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, but even before that, I would argue, as was pointed out, that the real crisis that was in place was one in which a crisis of capitalist profitability on capital investments with respect to uh, fixed production as well as the capacity to extract higher levels of surplus value for workers was one that was growing in the 1970s and so forth. And since the 1970s, capital has sought to create a means to reduce the necessity for Western workers, Western labor, uh, to produce for Western primarily markets. And so therefore, in the 1970s, there was a beginning of an effort to put down the American as well as European working class in a very significant fashion, uh, to reduce wages, to de-unionize uh, the workers in, from, from the major unions. But one of the major shifts, if I may very briefly, was the shift from production to services, but that shift to production was primarily one that was taking place by the relocation of industry both to low wage, low wage regions in the United States as well as peripheral countries of the United States as well as peripheries of Europe. Certainly Japan was one of those areas. But when I say the end of, uh, well we had the end of ideology in the 1970s, uh, we had the end of history with Francis Fukuyama's book in 1990s early 1990s, and I would argue that one of these, you know, the end of history, the end of ideology, the end of various forms of socialism, communism, and so forth, was really not the end of all these ideas that were related to 
objectives that people had achieved this was just so well put forward in, in the 1970-17 Bolshevik Revolution and the 1949 uh, People's Revolution in China because they were actually rooted in materialist and historical relationships. And therefore, I would argue that maybe the 1990s represented the end of utopia. And in that sense, what I'm really referring to is that this sense of utopian socialism, which really inflected Western thought for, until this day, if it actually exists, really came to an end. People accepted the fact that this notion of a millennium, millennium form of socialism, communism, etc., was really not real. It was a fiction. And I would share that perspective, and therefore perhaps it was good that we went through this period in the West, as well as elsewhere, that uh, we no longer believe in utopianism, utopian socialism, and other forms of syndicalist types of organization, which I will discuss um, today. I would argue that at the same time, the real crisis was rooted within social democracy to the degree that it exists in Europe and North America, and the forms of socialism and socialist democracy, social democracy that exist in India and India and other parts of the global south. That in many ways, it seemed that liberal bourgeois democracy was the only form that we could actually engage and struggle. <coughs> For a person like me in the late 80s, early 1990s, uh, when I was coming of age, I mean, I really kind of gave up with uh, the traditional electoral system in the US. Not to say that I ever really had any, any illusions to begin with, and I must confess I, I never did really. But I, I always felt in the, very strongly in the centrality of the working class, uh, as well as the degree to which the struggles of the working class were significant. And therefore, the 1970s restructuring that followed the oil crisis, and really was a reflection of the decline in profitability, capacity for capital to extract profits from the working class and also to extract uh, surplus through the realm of distribution where there was a decline in that capacity that took place in the years between, I would argue, 74 to the 1990s and even today. And as is pointed out over and again by people that uh, are specialists in political economy, that the economies of the West as well as those throughout the world that had to engage in a form of market capitalism, which I think in some ways is better to use than neoliberalism, which is kind of just a term that people throw around without necessarily discussing what it means. But the marketization of the economy, the liberalization of the economy, really did not leave any opening for struggles within the electoral arena, and that the traditional party system that many people built really made a difference between the, what many people refer to as the center left and the center right uh, was was really all that could be had. So in, in any case, getting back to this point of electoral politics and its relationship to fascism, which I think has historically been the case with respect to Europe in the early 20th century, where we had a vast and dramatic rise of fascism in the second and third and fourth, second and third and into the fourth decades of the 20th century, that this rise of fascism was really a reflection of the crisis of bourgeois democracy. And so I, I would submit to people, and hopefully we can open up for discussion, that really left politics was at a dead end. And it remained to be, till this day, a dead end. And we see this taking place in the elections, not just here, but also with, to a greater extent in Europe, uh, Actually, just about anywhere, North America, Europe, and uh, Asia, and Africa, to a lesser extent. But for a person like me, it was very clear that the choice was not between center-left and center-right. It was between right-wing and far-right, and maybe even fascism. One corollary to this is that if we look at a non-utopian politics, we can can see fascism, which has come to a uh, new beginning and actually is growing in power throughout the world, as 
something that is not rooted in any kind of ideological, immaterialist uh, understanding. But this, I mean, that it's rooted in a material reality uh, that uh, defends capital at all costs and also defends uh, those privileged members of a nationalist working class that uh, are considered to be preferred by the ruling class. And I can think. Uh, it could create the basis for a, uh, uh, a political block. And therefore, I think it's, it's apropos to discuss the idea of political blocks because I, I'm going to actually extend the failure of the left, which is not just one related to social democracy, but also the left within academia, uh, the, which is actually a broad indictment of the left from most uh, socialists who consider themselves uh, uh, democratic, but are not in my view. And I can tell you why they're not, because it's actually a prescription for failure. But also going into a discussion of the actual, uh, you know, so for most, most people, just get back to that point, most democratic socialists, socialists, as well as those that are engaged in the kind of Sentimental, in my view, ideas of creating a socialism again through a utopian construct, or alternatively, through a understanding that is rooted in dividing the working class into various sectors, and, and actually some kind of osmosis takes place in which everyone becomes part of the socialist world without any kind of class struggle, without any kind of struggle whatsoever but it just takes place. Anyway, so for instance, one of the most important highlights of the contemporary era, which I remember, and you probably do as well, there was a tremendous amount of elation about was the movement in Greece against capitalism. Syriza was considered to be the iconic representation of a socialist left. Not for me, in fact, I, I don't even want to say it. I mean, I, I consider uh, Syriza to be defeated even before they took power, and I think many of us can understand why that is the case. Uh, they were essentially a social democratic party to the left of the social democrats. They replaced PASOK as the social democratic party with a more militant ideology, but in effect they were engaged in the same kind of politics of uh, compromise that is essential for liberal democracy, liberal bourgeois democracy. But I, you know, many of us may be familiar with political scientists and political economists that are just kind of enamored with this idea of political blocks. It, it seems to me to be kind of the most important analytic perspective among social scientists within the university. And this is the idea that we can actually put together a block of the left by parsing together various parties, including socialist parties. So therefore, I was about to say Basar, therefore Syriza in Greece, which branded itself as some kind of socialist party, was actually an alliance with a nationalist front. They could not take power without that front. And so I recall so vividly in places you know that you also had the historical materials and conference here several years ago. But I remember in London several years ago too, uh, political scientists such as Leo Panitch uh, were arguing for the development of political blocks. And this was supposed to be some kind of transformative moment that we would all be extremely uh, happy with in some ways. But I don't think, and I, I have respect for uh, Professor Panish, but I don't know whether people actually looked at the degree to which anything would change under the creation of political blocks. Before Syriza took power, the idea of Syriza gaining power required a right-wing nationalist base. And I think in many ways this represents the kind of limitations of electoral politics, at least in the West. I would argue perhaps more promising, uh, within Latin America, we did have what many of us refer to as the Pink Tide, which was the rise of a left movement out of the struggles that took place in the 1980s and 1990s, for instance, the Nicaraguan uh, revolution, 
And even going back to the Cuban Revolution of the 1950s, there was this notion that those struggles were largely failed, although I don't think they were necessarily, especially Cuba, certainly it had its limitations. But they failed because of capitalism, because of neoliberal capitalism. So therefore, I would like to very briefly focus, we can have a discussion about it, on the case of Venezuela as an alternative model. Uh, in fact, that's precisely what it was referred to as socialism for the 21st century. Um, Michael Leibowitz became one of the major advocates of this, and um, put forward that this was actually the model, that you could achieve socialism through a government that was sympathetic to socialist workers' movements and socialist forces within the urban areas without actually taking power, without actually seizing control of the interstices of the state. And yet at the same time, if I may use the term neoliberalism, created a trap because at the same time the country was uh, engaged in in a process of struggle between a ruling class and an upper middle class and forces that were highly antagonistic to any kind of revolutionary change without actually, Hugo Chavez could not actually gain control of a political power, a party on a broad level and as a consequence uh, this, I would argue that the major failure, if there is one, although time remains to be seen where that goes, was the fact that a party did not control the state in a way that, for instance, as was pointed out earlier, uh, we saw examples of revolutions in the early to mid 20th century. But again, for me, it was already clear by the 1980s um, that really labor movements were uh, the only way in which we could promote change, and that I became a union organizer in the 1980s because I felt that um, the electoral arena was completely a waste of time. Of course, I'm an American and I think everyone here would probably understand why I feel that way because there really isn't any choice between this duopoly of the Democrats and Republicans. And in many ways I would argue that um, this party system, which is not rooted even in social democracy, I would say it's a right-wing and an ultra-right-wing power our party at this point, I don't know which is which, that um, you know, forced many people out of the political arena and into social movements. And uh, therefore, people like myself studied uh, the labor movement, worked in the labor movement, organized workers in different contexts. And yet, there was always this notion uh, that the left would return to this kind of block politics, unifying a base, that somehow we would encourage this block to create a socialist political uh, discussion at the very least, but maybe a political system. Okay, very really briefly, to discuss the question of imperialism, I, I think, you know, certainly it was well articulated uh, with respect to the nature of the imperialist crisis today that is rooted uh, in uh, overproduction in many respects, although that overproduction is only because of the recipients of the the global commodity chain, which uh, are the consumers, largely in the West, although here as well, uh, that tend to be um, workers and middle class um, citizens and um, others that uh, really cannot resolve this major uh, problem of capitalist uh, production. Um, we see it, I, I don't want to go into the specifics of it, but we see the process going on it, with respect to inter-imperialist politics, uh, inter-imperialist uh, rivalries that have emerged, um, the fact that the struggles that have taken place amongst workers from Indonesia to China and Malaysia, etc., in the eastern uh, regions of Asia, uh, to a large extent reduce capitalist profits. Um, and I'd also like to put forward the point that I think is crucial, that in order to advance imperialism, uh, this is a argument that I am not the only one to make, that you do need a military uh, power. That military power contributes to the sustenance of both labor markets, low-wage reserved army, reserve armies of labor, 
but also markets for uh, sales and also markets uh, for raw materials and so forth. So that when we take a look at global imperialism, we certainly have the major imperialist powers operating. Within that context, we also must recognize that there are sub-imperialisms uh, that engage on a regional level. Uh, I think it's very important with respect to look at the work of Rui uh, Marino and his Brazilian scholar who's written extensively on sub-imperialisms that operate throughout the world. So just getting back to the point in terms of well, how can we relate nationalism, forgive me, imperialism to nationalism and fascism, uh, and war for that matter, uh, I think once again that we can look at the early 20th century where, for instance, there were uh, the contestations for power between actually socialist-based parties, some that were electoral, many that were not electoral, uh, and in fact this became a very pervasive uh, understanding that social democratic parties and fascist parties were competing against the left, the broad left, in this case the Marxist left, or as we know it today as the Marxist-Leninist left. But Marxist-Leninist left was crushed in Europe outside of Russia, as we all know, and this brought about, uh, in my view, fascism. But within this context, I think it's crucial to understand that the Social Democrats laid the groundwork for fascism to take place by crushing uh, the communist movements that were revolutionary parties and engaged in many cases in the West, in this case Europe, in a, a really authentic type of, uh, of class politics and uh, socialist uh, ideals for transformation. I think also that it's important to demonstrate that within the left itself there was a number of I think it would justifiably, I must say, that there were a number of offshoots to the socialist movements in places like Germany. So there you had in 1918 the foundation of a consul communist movement, which was in many ways, in my view, a deviation from uh, communism and undermined the capacity for a communist party to emerge strongly in, in Germany. Uh, yes, it was called a uh, revolutionary movement through various types of workers' committees. But in those workers' committees, we can see the failure of spontaneity that I was asked to speak on, and which I think, uh, with, a, with respect to time, I would like to focus attention on. Because in fact, again, the argument is that, yes, there was a social democracy that crushed capitalism, I forget the kind of communism, as well as the kinds of, uh, any kind of uh, bourgeois democ democratic uh, Capitalism and capitalist type parties have laid the groundwork for fascism. Just as a side note, I, I want to re emphasize the point that I made earlier about fascism. And I think it's crucial in looking at fascisms today, and I use the term S as in plural, because there isn't any one garden variety type of, one central type of fascism. They exist in many contexts as a continuum across the board. And some are much more pernicious than others, as was certainly the case during the Second World War. And others, well, I, none are actually very good in terms of what they will bring about. Uh, in fact, most of them believe in, you know, obviously, the primacy of a specific kind of people uh, and a subordination and elimination of others who are considered to be undesirables. And so, therefore, I use the term fascism. If you and we are trying to understand the left, we must understand the right. Fascists exist across the plane. Uh, thus, for instance, in Hungary, you had a fascism that was nationalistic, you had a fascism that was uh, opposed to foreign, foreigners in their country, as you do even to this day, and you also had the more uh, virulent Nazi varieties of fascism. And by the way, incidentally, in Eastern and Western Europe, we have the same kinds of uh, spec spectrum of fascism. Uh, so therefore, in Ukraine today, probably 
know, many people say, well, there's no fascism in Ukraine. Well, I mean, please, there's no fascism in Ukraine. And they say something like 2% of the population in Ukraine are fascists. 2%, forgive me, 2% of the elected officials, if you read the American propaganda, which is the New York Times and the other press, the Washington Post, as well as elsewhere, that, that they would argue, argue that 2% is the case when, in fact, 30 or 40% in Hungary, which is, I would consider, somewhat uh, more liberal-minded than Ukraine. But there's absolutely no way in Ukraine that just 2% of the party structures are fascist, that I think the entire state is inflected by fascism. And the only alternative to fascism is some kind of bourgeois democracy, which actually is not actually available in Ukraine and is really foreclosed in places like Hungary. And as we'll see, and as you've noticed that three months ago, four months ago in, in Austria, there was an election which, uh, in fact, it's very clear at this point that there were huge irregularities and that the fascist party, uh, Freedom Party took uh, one in charge of the votes for the presidency. It wasn't the same kind of party as the fascists uh, that existed in the Second World War, uh, especially the Nazis, but there, some of their ideological perspectives are anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner, anti-Roma, anti-Semitic, anti, anti, anti uh, any kind of political uh, orientation that's specifically focused around socialism and communism. And also pro-Zionism, you know, how do you like that? Pro-Zionist fascist party in, in Austria, the Freedom Party. That gives us a certain sense to which uh, these kinds of forms take different shapes. But yet, at the same time, there really isn't any left in Austria that is organized, except those that are forming, and I would argue very strongly that we do see a growth in a Marxist, and if I may, Marxist-Leninist, as well as Maoist left that has grown in uh, Europe, to a lesser extent in the United States, but certainly in Europe. And, um, and there are many very interesting examples of this uh, throughout the world as well. Um, so what's happened throughout the rest of the world? I think that uh, we're all you know, certainly aware of the post-independent struggles that took place. That, in my book, I tried to demonstrate there has been a sort of recolonization of the world that actually reflects the colonial types of power structures that existed on an international basis, whereas, for instance, the West has shifted production, not just anywhere, but to the global south, uh, the former countries that have been subjugated to imperialism. And then we now have a definitive type of exploitation that doesn't flow east-west but flows more south. And it actually would argue that that was always the case. You know, certainly that there was internal exploitation amongst Western countries and northern countries. But in this context today, the primary force in exploitation is one in which we have super exploitation in the former colonies of the West. And I also like to make the, the point that this is not a does not take the form of college partnership with the ruling classes of the West. In this case, the ruling parties and the ruling ruling classes of India are, are really in lockstep with the the northern ruling class. I'd like to start off with a discussion of the. Well, second part of this discussion is so the limitations of spontaneity as socialist as a socialist project. A socialist project and strategy, as I would put. I would argue that there is, as I said earlier, there's a utopian vision of communism. And I would argue that socialism uh, is also in this case, there has been also a socialist idea of spontaneity, that there is a sense of Marxists. I really don't know really who all these Marxists are who they claim to be, but it seems to expand it dramatically. Um, and I think that there is a definition of what a Marxist uh, approach is that is much more accurate. But in this case, with respect to spontaneity, 
that uh, it also had the same kind of utopian vision. And let me just give you something before I get into the historical perspective, because I actually have worked very closely with spontaneous workers' organizations over the last 15 to 20 years. I think perhaps a, a scholar that many people in this country do not know as well is Scott Lind, who is considered to be the doyen and the key advocate of the idea of spontaneous action and the notion of what is referred to as worker self-activity. Now we should ask ourselves, well, what is worker self-activity? We go to a workplace, how do we recognize what worker self-activity actually is? Well, as I've said over and again, as a worker organizer, as a person who actually knows how to organize workers, that's probably what I can do best, that we see worker activity anywhere, even in the most repressive worker self-activity, in the most repressive workplace. So therefore, I can actually give you specific examples of when you even have a despotic workplace, there will be worker self-activity. Now, in some ways, this also reflects some of the literature that we've seen, including that by James Scott, to a certain extent, the early work of Michael Furroy, who has documented worker self-activity in the mining industry and so forth. But, you know, certainly with respect to weapons of the week and his early studies of the Indochina war, James Scott argued that, you know, in fact, the real workers' movement, or the real authentic movement of the working class and peasants was based on these kinds of responses that workers engaged in to kind of give them a certain form of legitimacy. I have to tell you, I remember this vividly it's in my readings, obviously, in the, well, not obviously, uh, James Scott's work was published in the early 1980s and into the 90s in the present era. He's actually now come out as being a an anarcho-syndicalist to a certain extent, uh, an anarchist. He wrote in the latest book he wrote is, I think, uh, uh, two, I forget, it's two something for uh, anarchism, two shout outs for anarchism. Forgive me for forgetting the title at the moment. But here again, you know, when people gossip behind the back of the employer, any work organizer, and I said also here, there's a son, you know that that's the basis for organizing that workers will always do that, even the best of places. There, for instance, there is always uh, the kinds of, uh, give you kinds of work activity where you have small groups of workers, they are typically apolitical, typically lacking any kind of class consciousness, and they're engaged in direct action. So, so what kind of direct action are people like James Scott? But not just James Scott, and I think someone that you should remember, Scott Lynn, who was, worker, was working in the civil rights movement, the anti-prisoner movement, and as well as the workers' movement. And he and his wife, Alice Lynn, wrote a book called uh, Rank and File, and then the new Rank and File, in this case. And who, again, these new Rank and File, they're engaged in slowdowns. Well, we're all engaged in slowdowns. I think students can engage in slowdowns as well. Uh, they're engaged in gold bricking. Uh, taking it easy, sleeping on the job, sickens, sometimes not really official, without any kind of goal or objective. I mean, I would argue this is the form of passive aggression that is being advocated by leading socialist intellectuals. Scott Lynn considers himself a socialist. Many of these scholars that today are making tremendous waves in the West, including David Graeber, amongst others, I won't mention any more names, I could. Uh, but these are people who consider themselves anarcho-socialists of one kind or another, and they take pleasure in the idea of engaging in protests without any goals, without any objectives, without any agency even. And yet, even just like the worker is engaged in a constant process of struggle against the employer, that is always the case, even in the I would argue even in the work camps, uh, in the most difficult kinds of prisons, we know all of these various uh, liter incredible literature of workers who are in 
work camps or even concentration camps that engage in resistance in some way, at least. Um, and then, in fact, to such a great extent, these writers consider their, or these thinkers, intellectuals, consider that it's okay not even to have economic, even economistic objectives. The moment that a union is constituted, according to most of these scholars, and an organization of workers is established, they are derided. I have seen this happen over and again. So in other words, whenever you have an organization that forms, even an economistic one, one that I would actually not agree with their objectives, even if they're, but if they're engaged in class struggle of one kind or another, even if they don't have a political analysis of anything, it's considered to be, oh my god, this is really horrible. We, we actually have an organization. We have to fight that organization in order to create a more anarchistic, syndicalist union, which means that you have no union at all. It's a prescription for failure, in my view. And I don't say this from a, any kind of ideological perspective, but just as a union organizer, if you don't have anything that you're fighting for, you might as well just go home. And I think this was certainly the case with respect to the Occupy movement in the United States. I mentioned David, David Graeber, but many others were involved in it. And the other point I wanted to make is that just like they were making no, they were arguing that there was no leadership, there was a secret leadership. It's not a cabal or anything like that. It actually were leaders who actually did not fought it out amongst themselves, who would take credit, who would write the most important article or book that would be about this. So let me give you a few examples in the contemporary era of syndicalist, or what I can refer to in this context, as spontaneous types of union activity. The Jimmy John's sandwich shop campaign in the United States. Eric Foreman, who I mentioned to you, is one of the leaders of the group uh, where they organized without the objective of forming a official union. Without going to the labor board and saying we want to have an official union representation because that would be really anathema to everything they believed in. You know, once again, my God, you're going to form a union? That's completely opposed to what we believe in with respect to spontaneity. And these are the most rudimentary forms. In other words, the workers would say, well, so where are we going to take power? Where is the organization? As it turned out, there was an organization uh, of several people who were leaders, but they were largely concerned with their, in my view, uh, their own grandiose ideas of becoming leading agents for social change. I think they were highly deluded by the capacity to create that. And also there is the, and I think we have other examples here in this country, the Starbucks coffee shop in the U.S. Uh, there's an IW local. Many of the proliferation of IW locals have formed in the United States over the last 10 or 15 years to reflect, in many cases reflected this expansion of interest amongst young people, especially in spontaneous organizations or syndicalist, anarcho-syndicalist types of organizations. Every single one of them, bar none, has failed. Yet they go on and on, and actually I think they are internally mobilized to fail. The IWW has, in fact, they're a very top-down organization in which you don't have to become, you don't have to be a worker to be a member, which I think is one of the most undemocratic forms that one could imagine. In, in fact, many organizers who I respect in the IWW today, and I'll actually then I can mention Daniel Gross of the Grand Workers Campaign argues that, you know, you really should you can have a workers' organization. You should have worker membership, not these college or university professors paying their dues on a regular basis. Uh, and so demonstrating how left they are, and in this case, you know, how, just how wonderful is it that you're a leftist who doesn't stand for anything except for the idealistic notion of workers' rights. I was also involved in a number of worker centers, supporting them and advocating on behalf of them. In fact, I never formed them, but I supported them on a regular basis and helped organize with them. The people here know what worker centers are, the model that we have in the United States, but mainly the United States. I would argue they're not just worker centers, they're immigrant worker centers. And they have largely proliferated by the hundreds throughout the country. A number of writers have written about it, Janice Fine amongst them, and many others, including myself, 
And the idea that we're always struggling with was, okay, you've got a worker center. How were they structured? They were structured on the basis of a actually a community of workers who had come together, and I think this is instructive, uh, and be mobilized by leaders who were funded, this is very important, by NGOs, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, other foundations in which people gain tax write-offs, including the most uh, mainstream of organizations like uh, the United Fund, even. Um, and they would specifically focus on local industry level organizing. I think this is important actually to recognize. So therefore, within the amongst restaurant workers in New York City, you had something called the Restaurant Opportunity Center. Amongst Mexican workers who also worked in restaurants but also in small shops, you had uh, the Mexican American Workers Association. This uh, also continued amongst Filipina groups and Filipina groups uh, amongst domestic workers. You almost name the field of exploitation, which uh, we have uh, in the United States, where immigrant workers have dominated. You have these worker centers for two reasons. One, traditional unions, the social democratic um, organizations or in the United States, the apolitical unions, largely, were not interested in organizing small shops and on a neighborhood basis. And, and concomitantly, uh, these organizations well, the reason why unions were not interested, and I think this is crucial, is because they didn't really organize enough workers to make it financially worthwhile for the union in terms of dues paying members. As well, the whole idea of the NGO leadership and a shift that took place. In other words, people after a period of time within these worker centers who are frequently led by NGO type players, all of them across the board, I can mention them. And again, I'm not going to get into the names if I could, but it's not really necessary at the moment. I mean, I blame myself, but I think it was a learning process for me, so I won't blame myself. Uh, but anyway, they, they, there were hundreds, if not hundreds, or if not several hundreds of organizations that formed around the United States to support immigrant workers' rights. But in fact, members did not have to actively be involved. Uh, sometimes you would have meetings. Many of them were highly lacking in any kind of practical skills that workers could engage in. In other cases, they were, uh, but the major failure, I would argue, is that after a period of time, because the organizations were for the leaders and not for the members, the kind of spontaneity that workers engaged in at restaurants and coffee shops and laundromats at uh, various types of vegetable stands and fruit stands and taxi and for higher vehicles. But first of all, the unions didn't want them, and actually the leaders didn't want them after a period of time, for the most part. There are certain exceptions to this with respect to the taxi workers, where there had been a mobilization that continues in some way. The extent of it, I think, remains somewhat uh, questionable. Some of you may actually know the work of Bijou Matthew uh, with respect to taxi. He's written a book on the subject, which is of uh, some uh, very important interest. It may and in fact, that organization has been the most uh, effective because it did not do what I'm about to say. Many of the organizations became advocacy organizations. After a period of time, people get tired, even in the leadership, and they shift to an advocacy model, which means that rather than actually engaging in worker spontaneity itself, they repress it to a hard level, a very hard, large extent. And these people go on to careers in NGOs, university professorships, um, in various ways and to great acclaim. They win Arthur Awards and so forth, also NGOs type awards. But at the heart of all this, as opposed to the traditional union, there's actually no wish for power whatsoever. They're not interested in achieving power. They are not interested necessarily in official status or actually maybe even gaining anything because the idea of having a poor working force is somewhat romantic that they're, they're organizing these workers. And that um, what they seize upon, and what we seize upon, I'm not going to say they, but what we seize upon in the United States, is not just the resistance and the power of workers, but the powerlessness of workers. Let's pick a workforce that is highly powerless. So therefore we can defend them. You know, for instance, the Americans love to see the most uh, 
exploited workers so that they can have a society to defend them. In much the same idea, and I think with respect to spontaneity, there is a, obviously many of you are interested, very well uh, familiar with it, it's the American style of subalternism. Those poor Mexican workers who are highly exploited, who are, in this case, who, who are responsible for preparing our food every day at the restaurant, who are sitting in 40, 50 degree Fahrenheit, working 40, 50 Fahrenheit, 60, that's not skinny, maybe even higher, not more than 45. Um, kitchens and working 16 hours a day. So it's a really nice idea to support them, right? Because they're the most highly exploited. I, I agree, but in some ways it seems to be a necessity to have the high, most highly exploited workers to organize to advance this notion of subalternism, subalternism, subalternality. Um, I'm going to just, uh, finish briefly. So the limits of spontaneity as a socialist project, as I pointed out earlier, is that it never really achieved or sought or achieved to take power, power. And it devolved in a kind of, as I pointed out, a kind of a workerist form of uh, so spontaneity, uh, the freedom of the uh, And that, uh, yes, I'll speak about this. That if we read the work of, for instance, uh, if you're familiar with Gramsci's work on subalternism, the newfangled forms of postmodern subalternism that uh, is being promoted as being Gramsci's work, I think, is completely incorrect. What they're interested in, and I think, you know, very clearly, we must advance the interests of and the concrete and objective conditions of those most oppressed groups that I just spoke of, Mexican workers, women workers, Filipina domestic workers, and so forth, very much concerned with that. But at the same time, uh, with respect to misusing Gramsci's work, they're interested in dissecting what the working class is. In fact, working class is not precisely a working class. It is a group of people who are divided on the basis of race, gender, believe it or not, class. I really don't get it, but if you read modern perspectives of Gramsci's work, they see class as an equal to race, gender, and other kinds of identities. Now, I would argue that certainly racial, gender, and other identity differences are significant, but certainly people feel their oppression on the basis of class and can only be mobilized as a class base if they are to be mobilized in a sustained way over a long period of time. I don't see any example in the history of humanity and capitalism where people were mobilized on the basis of gender or race and were able to sustain it over a long period of time in a revolutionary fashion. Certainly we could perhaps think back at the Haitian Revolution, the slave revolt, that was a class-based revolution. But even there, there was a I would argue primarily an anti-colonial struggle that was at the heart of it. So where are we right now? We're essentially at a choice between an ossified left to get to the final point of this presentation, uh, a left that doesn't exist, uh, a left uh, that uh, is rooted in social democracy here, uh, but in other parts of the world it's rooted in a mainstream democratic bourgeois ruling class led party. And uh, if we move to some other organizations that are independent-based, uh, a non-party non organization, the absence of party is what we should uh, advance, according to many. And in fact, if we take a look at the landscape of workers' movements around the world, spontaneity is the primary form. Independent unions are certainly engaged in this kind of uh, activity. They're not actually independent at all because in many ways I would say they're even less independent than traditional unions, precisely because of their reliance on foreign NGOs for their power. Forget the state. Uh, I would say it's probably even more illegitimate to rely on do-gooder organizations, self-right, you know, selective righteous organizations and foundations from 
the West. Uh, and here, I would argue that you know, for, it's interesting that the right wing has seized on the question of NGOs here and elsewhere as a pernicious force. You know, for instance, in Russia, uh, under Putin, there is a uh, high level of opposition to NGOs uh, under this uh, uh, form of oligarchical uh, capitalism that has taken shape in the uh, former Soviet Union. Uh, in China, certainly, the greatest antipathy has been left for NGOs. Here as well, uh, we've seen the growth of uh, opposition to NGOs. I think this also reflects the degree to which NGOs are really trying to say, let's go after the most exploited people. Just as a sideline here as well, or a sidebar, that in the 1990s, in the former Soviet Union in Russia under Yeltsin, there was a outpouring of, of NGOs that went to Russia. Most of them were supported by the traditional organizations. Some of them were actually U.S. and foreign government organizations, such as the National Endowment for Democracy, which was created by Ronald Reagan, to ensure people were poor enough so that they could actually be appropriate for NGOs. So, for instance, there was a movement in, in uh, the Russian Federation amongst workers who were not paid their wages. Uh, there was huge back wage campaigns. And one of the organizations that was supported by the NED and even the American Federation of uh, Labor, uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations, the major state federation, uh, were engaged in a campaign that they were sponsoring through NGOs to wait, be patient, to wait for your back wages. They will come and maybe you should just you know, take it easy. I think in many ways this led the basis for the success of right-wing reactions. Um, and right-wing reactions that I would say are in some ways anti-imperialist. So who's taken the advantage with respect to uh, anti-imperialism? It certainly is not the left. It's certainly not labor movements. And this is not just within countries, it's on a global basis. It is, in fact, the right-wing in some ways, the fascist right, as we see in this country. So therefore, um, I would also make the case that these independent unions in this country that are supported by foreign NGOs to a large extent, uh, they are not only threatened, threatened by the state, but they're actually threatening their own workers uh, who they're seeking to organize. In many cases, I would certainly make a very strong case that they're not necessarily organizing these so-called sub-altering workers, but they're in fact organizing uh, the most privileged workers, the full-time workers in uh, this country, as they have in other parts of the world. Just, uh, I, know, you know, I can have a long discussion about the question of the essential revolutionary party, which I feel strongly after so many years, uh, not just kind of criticizing the established system, but also recognizing the fissures that exist on the left, uh, but really the fissures are between leftist movements and leftist organizations, I would say they're necessarily all movements. And, uh, certainly Occupy was a movement, and Louis de Bois is a movement, but I don't think uh, certainly most uh, leftist parties that are rooted in Trotskyism, uh, socialism, or uh, the Johnson Foster tendency, which we're are all familiar with, the Marxist humanist tendencies. And there's a litany of organizations, and actually some of them uh, are highly sectarian. Uh, I would argue that there's a tendency for Marxist Leninists not to be in a sectarian because of their recognition of, the, of Lenin's idea of self correction, which is also advanced by Mao, that we need to understand from past mistakes so we can correct ourselves in terms of understanding the nature of capital, the nature of workers, the nature of the state, and beyond. I, I really want to make a very strong and full-throated defense of a marxist leninist party. And um, I would also argue that a marxist leninist party is essential if we are going to move out of this type of... I, I don't know how many people want to live uh, as long as I have and see the same kind of games go on between uh, various uh, parties on the so-called right and left. Because in fact, I also went through the uh, academy and had been deluded by these newfangled theories of, of the Marxist, the non-Marxist left from postmodernism uh, onto subalternism and beyond. 
and they're highly deflating to anybody who believes in taking power from a you know, real historical and materialist perspective. How do we take power if we don't want to take power? In fact, you know, you're reminding me of actually a friend of mine, John Holloway, that you probably have read. You know, uh, see, uh, this entry of the book is titled uh, Taking Power and Taking the World Without Taking Power. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm sorry, changing the world without taking power. And, and, and you know, I was look, reading the book and I'm thinking to myself, you know, he's a nice guy and everything. What, what really is this all about? It was a bestseller and published by Pluto as well, so you should read it, I guess. But not this series. If anybody's interested in this series, by the way, I, I'm the editor of it, and I welcome manuscripts, especially ones that are in the tradition of a, uh, a movement rooted in uh, the reality of material conditions and historicism. They're ones that are rooted in the Indian condition, but even beyond. Uh, so if you're interested, please talk to me. But again, you know, uh, the, the John Holloway is not just one. He's, you know, when I speak to John Holloway, I say, well, okay, what do you really mean? I have, I've had countless conversations with, like, a, the person I mentioned earlier, Stong Min, who I have tre tremendous admiration for. He went through a lot of struggles. He lost his position at Yale. I won't give you an example, I won't give you this historical uh, trajectory here, but he, he constantly told me over the years, you know, what we really need is a worker self-activity movement. And I said, well, yeah, but how are you going to take power? I mean, you can't really physically, or in any serious way, take power unless you're just playing around. Here's a person who actually gave up a lot to advance worker self-activity outside of a party. Certainly we can have a discussion of the IWW. Maybe I should close with that because the IWW only lasted, and I think for, if we want to be realistic, and I will be realistic today, between 1905 and 1919 because precisely they did not have an organization that was rooted in a party. It was anti-capitalist, it was revolutionary, it believed in uh, class struggle, but there was no organization whatsoever. It still exists today in a different form, uh, but I think largely it is one that is celebrated rather than actually exists. But it's noteworthy to recognize that this political party or this organization, Industrial Workers of the World, uh, was replaced by the Communist Party and Communist parties throughout the world. They sort of ceased to exist by 1920. In the United States, the leading organizers, uh, William T. Foster, a very staunch Marxist Leninist, but very principled in that way, uh, believed in the necessity to have an organization, a sense of discipline, and I think a number of terms that we need to uh, uh, recognize that are rooted in Leninism is the idea of the Vanguard Party, uh, which is really a workers' Vanguard Party, because uh, essentially rather than saying to the workers, you really, we appreciate your spontaneity, but that's it. Uh, we can go home and have an intellectual exercise in a book or two or a couple of articles that we publish about them. That's basically the main purpose for me. I'm telling you, that's exactly what people do with the spontaneity. Intellectuals get uh, articles and books to write. And some of them get prime uh, jobs in the academy. The IW shifted, uh, its, it's uh, major denizens shifted into the